guys, Mr. Backberg here. This is part two of lesson 12.1. We've only got one objective for this video. We're gonna use properties of limits and direct substitution to evaluate limits. So here we've got a list of basic limits that we're gonna take a look at. Uh, for this, we're gonna let B and C be real numbers and N is going to be a positive integer. So if we look at this first one, we've got the limit of B as X approaches C and B is just a real number. So this would be a constant function. So the answer to this limit is going to be just whatever that b value is. For number two, we've got an identity function, so just a plain x, so the limit of x as x approaches c, and the limit there is just going to be whatever c number we're approaching. If we take that identity function and raise it to a power n, then its limit as x approaches c is just going to be whatever our c number is raised to that nth power. And our last one, if we've got some sort of even root function, so like a square root, a fourth root, then the limit as x approaches c is just whatever root of that c value we're looking at. We've also got this whole list of properties of limits that we're gonna take a look at. And again, just like before, b and c are gonna be real numbers, n is gonna be a positive integer, and then we've got these functions f and g. And for these properties, we're gonna say that the limit of f is l and the limit of g is k. Taking a look at this first property, if we've got a scalar multiple happening, so our function f times some scalar b, well, if we want to evaluate this limit, what we can do is we could actually find the limit of our function first, this l value, and then multiply by whatever our b scalar is. If we're adding or subtracting a couple of functions together, so the limit of f plus g or f minus g, what we can do is again evaluate each one of those limits first, get our l and k values, and then add or subtract them as needed. Similar things are happening if we are multiplying a couple of these functions together, so f times g and then doing the limit. Okay, We can evaluate that limit first, so find l and find k and then multiply them together. Same thing happening with our quotient. If we've got a couple of functions being divided and we're doing the limit, find that L and K value first and then do our division as long as K isn't zero because we can't have zero on the bottom of the fraction. And then we've also got this power property. So if we've got our function F raised to some power N, then we can evaluate the limit of F first and then raise it to the power of N. So basically what all of these properties are saying is whether we're adding functions together, multiplying functions, dividing them, or doing scalar multiplication, we can evaluate the limit first and then perform whatever extra operations we need to. So we've got six different examples on this page that we're going to take a look at. For this first one, we've got the limit of x squared as x approaches 4. Well, what we can do with this one is we can just take this 4 and plug it in for our x value. So we've got 4 squared, and we know that 4 squared is 16. In number two, we've got the limit of 5x as x approaches 4. Pretty much the same thing. We can take this 4 and plug it in for our x right there. So we've got 5 times 4, which is 20. In number three, this one is set up as a fraction. So what I want to do is evaluate each limit individually. So we've got the limit of tangent of x on top and the limit of x on the bottom. And these are both as x approaches pi. So on top, we've got the tangent of pi, and on bottom, we've just got pi. Well, the tangent of pi is 0 over pi, and if we take 0 divided by pi, we just get 0. For number 4, the limit of the square root of x as x approaches 9. Well, if we replace our x with the 9, we get the square root of 9, and we know the square root of 9 is just 3. For number 5, we've got a couple of things being multiplied together. We really have x times the cosine of x. So what I want to do is evaluate each limit individually, so the limit of x times the limit of the cosine of x. And then what we can do for both of those is just replace the x with pi. So we've got pi times the cosine of pi. Cosine of pi is negative one, so we have pi times negative one, so we've got negative pi. For our last one, the limit of x plus four squared as x approaches three. There's a few different things happening on this one. I see that we have a couple of things being added together. So I wanna do the limit of x plus the limit of four. But then there was a power on here, so we're gonna take this entire answer and put the squared power on it. Now if we evaluate this as x approaches three, so for this first one, we can just plug in three. So we've got three plus. On the second one, there's nowhere to plug an x in, so all we have is the four, and then we're going to square this answer. So inside of our brackets, we've got seven, and if we square that, we get 49 as the answer for that limit. A lot of what I was doing on that last page is something called direct substitution, where I take whatever our C value is that our limit is approaching, and I just plug it into the function to get back an answer. 
And this works out really well for polynomial functions and rational functions, as long as that denominator is not zero. So if we're looking at this limit, we've got the limit of 3x minus 2 as x approaches 2. Direct substitution says I can take this 2 and just plug it in for our x to evaluate. So we'd get 3 times 2, and then we'd have to subtract 2. So we'd get 6 minus 2, which is 4 for the limit. Two more examples to look at. For number 1, we've got the limit of x squared plus x minus 6 as x approaches negative 1. We're going to use direct substitution to just replace those x's with this negative 1. So we've got negative 1 squared plus negative 1 minus 6. Well, if we square negative 1, that becomes positive 1. We're adding a negative, so that's just like subtracting 1 and then minus 6. This 1 and that negative 1 cancel each other out, so our answer is just negative 6. Taking a look at number 2, we've got this fraction set up. We've got the limit of x squared plus x minus 3 all over x plus 3, and we're looking at the limit as x approaches negative 1. One thing we should look at before we do our direct substitution is checking to make sure there's not a zero denominator. If we plug in negative 1 on bottom, we're okay. We're not going to get zero on the bottom of this fraction. So let's run through and do the rest of the direct substitution. On top, we've got negative 1 squared plus negative 1 minus 6 all over negative 1 plus 3. We've already done this top stuff over here on the last example. We got negative 6 there. On bottom, if we take negative 1 plus 3, we're going to get 2. So the answer here is negative 3. That's going to be it for this video. Please remember to fill out the Google form linked in the description down below. And thanks for watching.